today's reading comes from the wisdom written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Better the poor walking in integrity than one perverse of speech who is a fool. Desire without knowledge is not good, and one who moves too hurriedly misses the way. One's own folly leads to ruin, yet the heart rages against the Lord. Wealth brings many friends, but the poor are left friendless. A false witness will not go unpunished, and a liar will not escape. Many seek the favor of the generous, and everyone is a friend of a giver of gifts. If the poor are hated, even by their kin, how much more are they shunned by their friends? When they call after them, they are not there. To get wisdom is to love oneself. To keep understanding is to prosper. A false witness will not go unpunished, and the liar will perish. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mary. Let's bow for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So a headline caught my eye this week, and I thought I would share it with you. The headline is this. Saturday morning cartoons died on this day in 1992. And I don't know why this bothered me so much. It's like I first thought was, what, there's no Saturday morning cartoons? When did this happen? Why wasn't I asked about it? And, uh, but apparently, you know, in 1992, I was worried about other things, not Saturday morning TV. And, and of course, now, how we watch video has changed so much that it really is an irrelevant kind of a thought. But, but it just shocked me that they got rid of those Saturday morning cartoons without asking me about it. But they did. And there you go. So I tell you, I got a text this week, and it was something that just has stuck with me, and I can't get rid of it. And so I'm just going to get rid of it right now with you. So there's, a, there's a, a, a person, a young person in their late 20s who was at a church meeting a long, long, long way away. And very frustrating weeknight church meeting, and I got this text after the meeting. Feedback from tonight. Old people don't like when children read Scripture. I'm so disheartened. Feedback from tonight. Old people don't like when children read Scripture. I'm so disheartened. And, and, and it just grabbed my heart, and it's just, it hasn't left me since I got it. And, and I don't know what to say about it. Usually when, when churches or congregations start pushing hard about children one way or another, I go to the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from, from Matthew 18, and I'll read, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus Christ. If this pastor is going to make a mistake, the mistake will be that children will be anywhere in the building they want to be. And that includes here. 
the, the loud and obnoxious ones, the quiet and the well-behaved ones. We want them all here or some other church. You see, sometimes I think we lose track that when we gather here, we're not the audience. God is the audience. We are all just participants in acts of worship. There's, there's, you know, if you want to call us anything, call us the congregation. But God is the audience of everything we do. And, and what we want to do is please God. So, so in, the, in the text, I've kind of covered the children part. In the text, it said, people don't like. So I just want to offer a kind of a warning, and I use this for myself. Anytime we start a sentence that says, you know, in worship, when they do this, I don't like. And then they can say whatever it is. That is a warning, because it doesn't really matter what we like. What matters is what God likes. God, God hit me almost 10 years ago. I was going to a new church, and, uh, and, and I had all these ideas about the things I wanted to see, the things I wanted to do, how I thought the church ought to be. And in and, and the way God sometimes whispers in my mind, in my ear, God said this, God says, you know, Mark, the more that church is the way you want it to be, the less it's going to be what I want. I'm like, whoa, whoa. Maybe I need to readjust and worry less about what I want and worry more about what God wants. You know, you hear me from time to time use a phrase like, we want to love everyone. You've heard that, right? And, and, and sometimes when I say that, I'll read the passage from Luke chapter 6 that I don't really like very much, but there it is. Luke chapter 6, I'm going to start at verse 27. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. If anyone takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in my mind, I was wondering, well, what if we use this as a, as a list of people that would be more than okay to be with us here in our service? What if we get to the point where it's okay if a child is here and we're not all that concerned about it? What if it's okay if someone who we really don't like is here and we're not... What if it's someone who's mean to us? What if it's someone who curses us? What if it's someone who steals from us? Can we get to a place in our heart where them being here is okay? Because what I think God wants in the kingdom of heaven is a place where all of His people can gather together the, from infants to the folks that are in their 90s. All of us together in a place where we offer acts of worship to God. I think that's what God wants. You know, the Bible over and over offers us glimpses into the character of God. And I'm just going to read from, from uh, Psalm 86, 15. And, I, and it looked like this was probably 15 different places in the Bible. And, and, and in Psalms 86, 15... But if you, O Lord, but you, O Lord, are, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's steadfast love and faithfulness. God sent His own Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ, in His ministry here on earth, gave us a glimpse of how we are to live. And, and through Christ's death and resurrection makes it possible for us to live in a relationship made right with God. So, we're going to start on the book of Proverbs today a little bit. We're going to deal with chapter 19 in Proverbs. Through the next four weeks, we're going to look at different, you know, we're kind of going to chop up that chapter and just look at the different verses. Uh, one of the commentaries I read uh, said that Proverbs is a marvelous collection of wise sayings, instructions for living, useful and effective for life. A collection uh, forms parts of a larger group of biblical writings known as wisdom literature. And that's like Job, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. All of these 
maybe Lamentations. I'd have to go look at the list. But, but these are all the books of the wisdom literature that we have. Proverbs is my favorite book. I just, I don't know why, but I like Proverbs. Pro, my favorite Bible verse is from Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Um, but, the, but the wisdom literature and Proverbs, they help us to, to get a sense of good and evil and, and the relationships between God and ourselves and the relationships between, between ourselves and, and other people. Uh, there's a... There's a lot of collections of wisdom literature from ancient times. You know, the Proverbs is the wisdom literature from, from the Israelites, but there's other ones out there, some older, some younger. But, but Proverbs is the one that links wisdom to a relationship with God. I know when I was in seminary, one of the things they said was that Proverbs was anthropocentric. Anthropocentric. Now, gang, you know if I'm using a big word, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? That's why I went to seminary was so I could answer questions with words and most people don't know. And it, come, it comes in handy from time to time. <laughs> Anthropocentric is a word that means human-centered. Human-centered. In fact, I can remember the Proverbs lecture in seminary right now as clear as day where my seminary professor said, Proverbs is anthropocentric, which means it really doesn't have much to do with God. It just has to do with people. But you don't go far in Proverbs without, in fact, chapter 1 has it, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs links wisdom with our relationship with God. Same with my favorite verse. And uh, the, the New Testament quotes uh, Proverbs more than I realized. And I'm not going to go through the list, but if you want to see it, I can get it to you. Either text me, email me, or just look at this after. But the Proverbs appears a lot more in the New Testament than I realized. Somehow our English teachers didn't get a hold of those Bible writers, and so nothing's really cited, you know? I never liked citing anything, right? But anyway, there you go. It's short, pithy statements. And one of the things that I marvels me about Proverbs is as you read it, it's kind of like potpourri. You don't know what's next. You know, it'll be talking about lying. It'll be talking about business. It'll be talking about God. It'll be talking about knowledge. It'll be talking about uh, friendship, folly, character traits. You just never know. And I'm just look, I was just kind of skimming a list of the nine verses that we're going to kind of focus on today. Well, we probably won't focus on all nine, but I mean, there's all those topics just in those nine verses. And there's even, even uh, some more. Even some more. <coughs> so, so wisdom is useful in life. When I define wisdom, often I'll use the John Maxwell definition. John Maxwell says this. He says, experience is learning from your own mistakes. Wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. And then sometimes when I'll describe wisdom, I'll say, well, wisdom is being able to come up with an answer when you have a, a very limited amount of information. And, and wisdom can help us make those good decisions. Wisdom can help us have those meaningful relationships that I've been talking about. can help us with our faith, can help us with uh, building projects, with diplomacy, with politics. Proverbs has it all. <clears throat> We should go to the next page, I think. The Bible says this in Psalm 111.10 and other places, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you're kind of like me and sometimes a little bit cynical and you know someone who's wise but doesn't seem to be connected with God, you just go, hmm, how did that happen? Because sometimes it seems to. But the Bible is clear, if we expect to have wisdom, it's connected to our faith. Wisdom is connected to the relationship that we have with God. The fear of the Lord, and that's not like a run away and be afraid. It's more of a reverence, an awe, an understanding that, that, that God is the creator. And we 
are the created. And then in that relationship with God, what comes from that is wisdom. Another verse says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but I'm talking more about wisdom today, so I didn't put any of those in. But, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus, uh, we, we think that most, uh, most of Proverbs is written by King Solomon, and it's a collection of his writings. And uh, one of the things I thought I would point out is Jesus referred to King Solomon. And one of the, the famous accounts of King Solomon is when a, when a queen from another country comes to Solomon because he was renowned for his wisdom and for his ability to, uh, to just, just do, do everything that he did. In fact, the high point politically for the Israelites was King Solomon. That's when they had the most wealth. That's when they had the most territory. That's when they traded with everybody. And King Solomon was able to handle those relationships with all of those partnering nations so that they got along and they all benefited versus pouring all their resources into conflict and war. And I'm, gonna go, I'm just going to read uh, verse 42. Because, but it starts, uh, the passage I'm looking at starts at verse 38 in Matthew 12. Some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And then Jesus goes on and says, You don't need a sign. You know, in fact, here's what Jesus says. An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be giving, given except the sign from the prophet Jonah. And uh, then he just goes on and talks about Jonah and Nineveh. And then at verse 42, he says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is described as being greater than really the greatest king, at least the king with the greatest results that Israel had. <coughs> I want to focus on verse 3 of Proverbs 19. One's own folly leads to ruin, yet the heart rages against the Lord. One's own folly leads to ruin, yet the heart rages against the Lord. So often we put ourselves into a mess and we blame God for it. We blame God for it. We have to recognize, I think, that our faith is an intentional practice of disciplines, of, of, of prayer, of reading, and then doing what the scriptures tell us to do. Um, I was in the Start Here class, we were looking at Scripture today, and I encouraged them to, to not get too bogged down on passages that they don't understand or passages that they don't like. Just the passages that you do understand, try to do what those passages say. Because there's plenty of passages where it's very clear what's expected. And the passages that we're not quite sure about, I would say maybe just set those aside and, and save them for another time. Because in another time, we'll be in a different place. We'll have different surroundings. We may have, you know, smarter people around us, who knows, that can help us understand. But, but, but never lose track of the, the commandments that Jesus lifted up as the most important. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's passage in, is in, in the verses that we have here of, uh, about, about poverty, about friendship. I'm going to shift now to verse 9. A false witness will not go unpunished, and the liar will perish. A false witness will not go unpunished. A liar will perish. And I don't know why as I was reading that, but what kind of jumped into my mind was the witness that we have for Jesus Christ. 
and how we talk about it's so important for us to be ready and willing to share the faith, to live a life where we set the example of a disciple that we hope to make. And so this, this passage here about being a false witness got me to thinking, is it possible that sometimes we're false witnesses to Jesus? And how if somehow we think we are, maybe, maybe we want to, to repent and to change. Because there are some out there who will come to know Jesus Christ because of you and because of me. Because of the love we have for one another and the love we have for God. So to the best of our ability, let's decide now that we will not be a false witness to Jesus Christ. That we will set the example and be the disciple that we hope to make. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to the next set of verses next week. And, and you may pray, as I'm going to pray, that I don't get any texts that bug me. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love and for your grace. And we ask now that you enter our hearts, that, that, we, we, that you cleanse us. And may we be the witnesses to Jesus Christ that you want us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.